Welcome to this special informative webinar where I'm going to be telling you all about feeding tubes and explaining how blended food can be used for tube feeding. I'm Claire Correa, registered dietitian and creator of the Natural Tube Feeding Resource website, and I'm honored to be partnering with the 22Q Family Foundation to provide this education for anyone who has a tube fed child or a child who possibly might need tube feeding at some point. Thank you so much for having me. Before we get into the talking about feeding tubes, I would like to quickly introduce myself. Like I said, I'm a registered dietitian and I'm also a board certified nutrition support clinician with over 16 years of experience working with tube fed people. I also conduct research on swallowing problems in tube feeding. My main career focus is the use of blended food for tube feeding, and this led me to create naturaltubefeeding.com, a website providing all the resources and information you need to get started with a blended diet. So first, I'd like to quickly explain what is a feeding tube. It's essentially a medical device, usually made from silicone or polyurethane, that is used to provide nutrition to people who can't eat by mouth, who can't swallow safely, or who can't get enough nutrition from eating by mouth. Common reasons for kids in the 22Q community to need a feeding tube are things like failure to thrive, which is a clinical term used when a child isn't taking in enough nutrition and gaining weight. Reflux can also be common, which is when stomach contents flow backwards up to the mouth. There can also be delayed swallowing development and feeding difficulties and perhaps times when tube feeding can help support recovery from surgery. I like to see feeding tubes as an opportunity to provide optimal nutrition, a reliable way to provide nutrition that can help with development and growth. A feeding tube does not prevent a child from eating by mouth and usually isn't necessary long term. So if your child is tube fed or likely to be tube fed, I encourage you to focus on these positives. I also really want to emphasize that you are not alone. There are many adults and children who are tube fed at home. I can't report an exact number because we just don't know the exact numbers, but the estimated number of tube fed people in the United States is 300 to 450,000. So odds are pretty good that you have already encountered kids or adults with feeding tubes, but you may not even know it. You see, feeding tubes are not necessarily visible to others. So there's several different types of feeding tubes, and some of them go through the nose um, and into the GI tract. So um, for example, nasogastric feeding tubes are tubes that go from the nose to the stomach. They're also referred to as NG tubes for short. There can also be nasojejunal tubes, and those are tubes that go from the nose to the small bowel, and are usually referred to as NJ tubes. So those tubes are visible, um, but the other types of tubes are gastrostomy tubes, jejunostomy tubes, and gastrojejunostomy tubes. And those three types of tubes go through the abdominal wall into the GI tract, um, either to the stomach in the case of a G tube, um, which is the short form for gastrostomy, or to the small bowel, as in a jejunostomy tube or a J tube, or they can have openings in the stomach and in the small bowel and that type of tube that has both of those potential um, feeding routes are called gastrojejunostomy feeding tubes. So here is a picture of a tube-fed child who has an NG tube. So you can see quite obviously that there is a feeding tube going into the nose and it would carry on down the esophagus or the throat um, right into the stomach of this child. There are also tubes through the abdomen, like I mentioned, and this is a picture of what's likely a G-tube, a gastrostomy tube, but it would look the same if, even if it's a J-tube um, or a jejunostomy tube, which would be a tube that just goes um, to the small bowel. Um, so these are the two types of tubes. They can either be through the abdomen, like this one, or um, a tube that goes up the nose, like the picture I just showed you. What I do want to point out is there's different designs for feeding tubes. Um, this is a picture of me holding up those two types. There's low profile designs and then there's long shaft designs. So um, on the right hand side of this slide is the picture, in the picture is a long shaft design. You can see there's tubing outside of the body. Um, and the one on the left uh, of the picture, that is a low profile tube. And it's also referred to as a button sometimes. 
and basically how it looks there in the picture is what it would look like most of the time until you need to access it. Then you, there's an extension tubing that clips in and um, turns it into the long shaft um, type of setup just for when you're administering um, food, fluids, or medication through the tube. Um, so um, there's advantages to, to the low profile tube as you can imagine. There's less tubing there so it's more comfortable for kids. There's less tubing so it's probably less likely that they're going to be tugging on it. Um, so if you are in a position where you're considering options for type of feeding tubes for your child, make sure that you have a good understanding of the different designs so that you can advocate for whichever one you feel will be more suitable for your child. So what do we put down a feeding tube? That's the next big question and there are many options. You can use tube feeding formula or food-based formula or blended food and fluids. You can also use these in combination with others, so you could potentially be using all three options if that's what works best for your child. Any combination could work. It's about finding what works best for your child or, or your lifestyle. So I'll just quickly explain what is formula. So when we use the term formula, we're usually talking about standard commercial tube feeding products. And these are products that are designed to be convenient and contain all necessary nutrition requirements. Um, so it would have all of the calories, protein, um, fat, as well as micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, electrolytes. It is a very highly processed food, so um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I do want to, to just point out that typically in a standard formulation, the ingredients um, are very much items such as water, um, sugar, a source of sugar, that's what's going to make up the carbohydrates, and sometimes that's corn syrup, sometimes that's maltodextrose, there's a variety of potential ingredients here, but generally one of the primary ingredients will be some form of sugar. Um, then there will be some protein source, which would be basically like a protein powder of some kind, usually milk derived, sometimes from soy. And then um, a fat source could be, like in this example, canola oil. And you're going to definitely have all kinds of additives, um, some of which are preservatives, some of which are um, vitamins or minerals. And um, everything's, you know, packaged in a shelf-stable product that's probably going to be, um, yeah, shelf-stable for about two years. So we're talking about highly processed foods. Um, generally, they are easy to digest, so um, I'm showing you these ingredients just so that you're educated as to what a typical formula might contain. Um, but if, if you're already using formula and it's working great for you, I'm not necessarily saying that there's any problem whatsoever with these ingredients. It's just about um, being informed about what is in these products and then making appropriate decisions, again, um, determining what's best for your child. So there's also food-based formulas, and these are relatively new. Um, it used to be that there was very little choice. Most people were just using those standard um, commercial products. But now um, we're very fortunate that there's several companies making fantastic whole food-based products. And really, the, the, their intention is exactly the same as those other formulas. Um, however, they're including whole foods. We're probably not adding any sugar. Most of these products do not have any added sugar. and um, they're just uh, highly nutritious from using whole ingredients. So it's really great because these products are also shelf stable for a long time. They're just as convenient as the other formulas. They do tend to be expensive. So I will caution you um, to that point. Um, but yeah, I just wanted you to get a good understanding of the options and one of which is definitely these food-based formulas. So the other option for tube feeding is a blended diet. This is where you take regular food and fluids and blend them together to create liquid meals for tube feeding. You get to choose the ingredients, which means that you can accommodate allergies and adjust meals as needed to make sure your child will be consuming foods that they feel good eating. Blending can help tube fed children remain engaged with real food and even get them involved in the kitchen and actively participate in family meals. Remember, blends can be used exclusively or in combination with formula. The sky is the limit. It's about finding what works best for your family and your child. So if you're interested in blending, that is great. Um, I do want you to understand that there are benefits and potential challenges with blending. And it's important that you understand these so that you can make an informed decision with your child's healthcare team. 
So what we're going to do now is go through the benefits and the potential risks of using a blended diet for tube feeding and um, hopefully that'll help you weigh the risks and benefits to make you able to make a, a decision as, on behalf of your child as far as what is best for their tube feeding. So the first benefit I want to touch on is that with a blended diet your child's likely to have a better quality diet and that's because fresh food is being used. Um, fresh food is where we can get antioxidants and things like omega-3 fats. We're getting natural fiber from real foods and probiotics. And generally, a blended diet is much, much lower in sugar than using standard formula. Um, and likely your overall ingredients for use of a blended diet will be um, much more appealing than what you might be seeing on the label of a formula package. The second benefit I want to touch on is tolerance. Um, what I mean by tolerance is that it, studies have shown that kids that are receiving blended food for tube feeding tend to feel better during and after their meals. They have less nausea, less vomiting, and less reflux. Studies have also shown improvement in bowel movements and have shown that um, we can feed blended food faster um, while still maintaining good tolerance compared to formula. So that might reduce the amount of time that your child has to be receiving meals through their feeding tube. Benefit number three is tube winning. So research has shown that using food for tube feeding may support transitions to eating by mouth. Um, so this could be because kids who see real food going into their feeding tube and are still exposed to real food with their tube feeding um, are more interested in eating and may progress more quickly to an oral diet. So that's potentially a huge benefit and one that we see from use of a blended diet. Another benefit is these positive mealtime experiences. So with blended food, you can potentially be blending the same food that the rest of the family is eating. And in that way, your child is sharing meals with their loved ones. You can blend up their favorite foods. You can blend um, culturally appropriate foods. And you can also um, sort of experience like a nurturing effect with, with home, feeding your child homemade meals. Another potential benefit is lower cost. And depending on what your insurance um, coverage is or what your financial situation is as far as funding for your tube feeding, um, this could be a big advantage. Where I practice in Canada, um, families do not necessarily receive coverage for their formula. So it's um, can, much cheaper if a family chooses to blend real food um, compared to purchasing specialized nutrition formula products. There are also potential risks with blended diets though and I, I really want to go through these as well so that you can understand that there are challenges to um, this approach to tube feeding. Risk number one would be nutritional inadequacies. This would be where the blended diet that you're feeding your child does not contain enough calories and protein and vitamins and minerals. And what would happen if that's the case is your child can lose weight, they could have impairment of their growth, they can have nu nutritional deficiencies, they can have um, or take longer to recover from surgery, and um, they would have potential impaired impairment of their immune system. So these are pretty serious effects and um, why it's so important that you make nutritious meals when you're blending. I'll just mention this case um, that was reported in the scientific literature where um, parents of a tube fed child made a blend that just contained beef broth and cooked vegetables and that's what they fed their tube fed child for several months. And the child developed a severe vitamin C deficiency and this would have been preventable had um, they been more open with their healthcare team about their plans to use blended food and involved a dietitian in their care and just have been more educated as far as um, what nutritious balanced blends need to contain. Another potential risk is bacterial con contamination of the blended meals. Um, compared to commercial products which are shelf stable and basically sterile, um, when you're blending real food, there is a risk of bacterial overgrowth if you're not preparing your blends properly or storing them properly. And if your um, blends are not properly prepared or stored, that can cause food poisoning. So you really, really need to avoid that. So you have to understand how to safely prepare, store, and feed blended meals. Another potential risk is infusion difficulty. 
Um, so definitely pumps are less reliable with blended food compared to formula. That's probably because of the particles in blends. Even with a great blender, you're probably going to have a bit of a bit more texture um, to a blend compared to formula. And some pumps are quite sensitive to that and they can alarm and stop running and, and that can be frustrating. Um, there is also a risk of tube blockages, but only really in small tubes. So if a tube is smaller than 14 French in size, that could potentially um, increase the risk of a blockage occurring. I do want to say that there have never been any studies that have shown that blended diets cause tube blockages. Um, so if, if your healthcare team has that concern or maybe is using that as a reason why they don't support a blended diet, that is not evidence-based. Another risk would just be the fact that a blended diet is much less convenient compared to the use of commercial formula. It does require nutrition knowledge, meal planning, grocery shopping, cooking, blending, cleanup. It is a lot of work and it's very time consuming compared to using formula. It is also difficult to use when on the go, like school can be a challenge to safely um, have blends that are refrigerated properly, for example. Um, traveling is more challenging. How, do you, how are you going to do that? Are you going to bring a blender? I mean, these are all barriers that can probably be, be overcome if you really want to, but just something to think about when you're making the choice um, to potentially include blends in your child's diet. I just want to um, stress here that not everyone experiences the same benefits with a blended diet, and not everyone experiences the same risks. What you need to do is weigh the benefits versus the risk and involve your healthcare team in those conversations. And it's so important that you know how to safely plan and prepare blended meals because that will keep you out of trouble and will make blending a, a potentially a really great experience for your child. So now I'd like to explain how to make nutritious blends. So there's several different approaches. This, probably the simplest way is just to mimic a typical diet. We, there's another approach called the, the use of plate proportions. I'll be explaining that one as well. And food group tracking, that's another approach that we can use to make it, it as simple as possible to create um, nutritious balanced meals when you're blending. Another um, approach is to use trusted recipes and I'll touch on that as well. So to mimic a typical diet, what you'd be doing for kids is using age appropriate foods and serving sizes. Um, so I think this is particularly um, simpler for people who have older kids in the family that kind of know already what a typical um, serving would be for kids of the age of the two-fed child. Um, if you're unsure about what would be age-appropriate foods and serving sizes, you can certainly get guidance from your dietitian and they should be able to help you with that. But this would be um, just mimicking what a child would eat by mouth, blending it up and, and feeding it through their feeding tube. Um, with this approach, there's generally no calculations involved. It's quite simple. It does allow for personalization of the child's diet. Um, so this would be kind of the, the easiest approach, but the, the approach with the least amount of knowledge as far as what is actually going into your blends in, in terms of calories and protein. So for some kids, we wouldn't recommend this approach. We'd want something a bit more exact. So here's some examples. Um, for example, uh, you could blend French toast. And if your child's at an age where they potentially eat two pieces of French toast and three strawberries, that's what you put in your blender with maybe a cup of milk and you blend it up and it can be given through a feeding tube. Another idea would be to blend up like a peanut butter sandwich as per this example, um, if that would be re reasonable for your child to be eating by mouth. Here's a blended oatmeal, um, which is quite a balanced meal because we're including fruit. There's some nut butter there from fat. Um, so you can make quite a nutritious blend that nutritionally is very similar to standard commercial formula as far as the calorie content, but without all that extra sugar. Um, so it's, kind of, it's quite exciting when you think what you can potentially do with a blended diet. Um, and yeah, even just blending simple meals like oatmeal, um, that could be a, a really easy meal for a two-fed child. So now I'll just mention um, how you would do the plate proportion method. Um, what we want to do with this approach is well, with use of a plate, you would put on the plate a balanced per, um, portion of protein, carbohydrate, and then you also make sure you have a fat source. Um, so in this way we're hitting all of the macronutrients 
in a balanced way. So it's, it's if you if there's a concern that a person might just be blending like pure protein and oil, um, this gets them away from that. So it makes you think, okay, what is the carbohydrate in this meal? What is the protein in this meal? And, and is there a fat source in this meal? And hopefully the answer is going to be yes to all those questions. So an example of that is this taco, um, because we've got protein from the beans and the cheese. We've got carbohydrate from the tortilla. We've got fat from the sour cream and from the avocado. So we've, we're hitting all those necessary um, food groups and we can just blend that up and we know we've got a balanced meal. Another approach is to use food group servings. So this is where we're aiming to include a certain number of servings from each food group. And the way we know how many servings you need from each food group for your child is usually determined by calorie goal. So definitely for this approach, you'd want to ask um, your healthcare team, your, your team's dietitian, to give some guidance on to what exactly to be blending and, and ask for a list of food group servings. And that way you can check those off as you include them in a blend every day. And you'll know that your child's receiving those goal calories and protein. Another option is to use recipes. Um, and with recipes, assuming that you can trust the source of the recipes, you're going to know that your blends are providing a specific amount of nutrition. So this is going to take away the guess, guesswork involved in blending, and you can know for sure that your child is getting enough calories and protein. I have designed um, 20 recipes that are nutritionally balanced, that are calorie dense. So there's lots of calories in a low volume, and that's another key when we're making blends. Um, and if you're interested, you can find this recipe book on my website. It's an ebook, so you can get it instantly, and it could be very, very helpful if you are interested in blending for your child. So when we're making blends, we really want to focus on the nutritional adequacy. And to do that, we need to be sure that our blends are containing protein, plenty of it. We want to make sure there's plenty of energy, which is what we really think of as calories, and that there's a balance of micronutrients so that there's no deficiencies um, as far as you know, vitamins or minerals. So one important point to blending that I want to touch on briefly is that you do want to make sure your, your blends are calorie dense. What I mean by that is you want to make sure that they contain plenty of calories within a reasonable volume. What I like to recommend is that you aim for at least one calorie per milliliter. So for example, if your blend is about 500 milliliters or two cups, in volume, it should contain at least 500 calories. If you make a blend that's 500 milliliters, but it only contains 150 calories, that's a huge problem. And that's where you will have issues with nutritional adequacy. And you could, your child could experience weight loss. Um, so aiming high with the calorie content of your blends is really, really important. Similarly, getting enough protein is essential for children. Um, so what you want to find out from your healthcare team is how many grams of protein they need each day, and then try to include a protein source in every single blended meal. And you can certainly use plant-based protein if you like. They tend to blend really, really easily. Um, I always provide my clients with a protein gram goal, which is basically the amount of protein you would need in each blended meal in order to meet daily protein needs. So let's just say that somebody needs 60 grams of protein, you're gonna do three blends for that person. Then you don't wanna make sure that every single blend you're making has 20 grams of protein. So the gram goal is 20. You're probably wondering now, well, how am I gonna know about the calories and the protein? This is sounding kind of complicated. I would just remind you that blending does not have to be perfect. We don't know the exact nutritional intake of kids who be, eat by mouth. So I don't really think we need to be overly concerned about that um, for kids who are too fed. However, sometimes kids who are too fed are medically fragile and we just don't want to take any chances of nutritional inadequacy. So what I could recommend to you if you are concerned or you really do want to kind of know the exact numbers of calories and grams of protein, you can use a nutrition analysis app. I recommend Chronometer. It's free and it's very helpful when starting out and it just helps you know that your child is getting plenty of calories and enough protein and micronutrients. So let's just uh, move on to how to make blended meals. It's so simple. Basically, we're blending solid food with enough liquid to make a smooth fluid texture that can pass through a feeding tube. 
So the ideal consistency is a smooth fluid texture without any lumps, because if there's lumps, you might have problems feeding in. And blended food can be fed through um, a pump, a, an enteral nutrition pump, or it can be fed using a syringe, or it can also be fed by gravity. And there are some special considerations when using blended food with these feeding methods. I have a blog post that's all about how to use a pump for, with blended food, so you can check that out on my blog. With syringe feeding, not all syringes are made equal. There are some that have an O-ring design and they slide much more easily and they are really, really helpful with use of blended food. You can also find information out about those on my blog. Um, with gravity tube feeding, you can certainly use that method, but you wanna make sure that you're using large bore bags, not standard bags because it, the blended meal will not flow well through a standard bag. You really need the larger tubing that comes along with the large bore style gravity bags. Now finally, in regards to food safety, you really need to be careful here. So you want to store unused blends in sealed and labels com labeled containers in your fridge and you want to write the date because you do need to keep track of that because blended food can only safely be stored in the fridge for up to two days and in the freezer I recommend up to two months and after that you should probably discard it. Um, if you are freezing your blends make sure you thaw them in the refrigerator not on the counter because there's a risk of bacterial growth um, if, as it thaws on the, unevenly on the countertop. So keep in mind that, like I said, a blended diet doesn't have to be perfect. You want to take the time to learn and figure out what works for you and your child. And if you're interested in some support, remember to visit my website. You can take a look at my recipe book if you're interested. And I also have an extensive blended diet online course um, where I walk through exactly how to make blended meals safely and effectively. Um, and I provide support um, for the, my students in the course, so that could be a way for you to access my expertise if you're interested. Um, so please take a look at that if you are curious about get, gathering more information about blending. All right, thank you so much for having me. It truly is an honor to speak to the 22Q community. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss two feeding and blended two feeding in particular. That is my area of expertise and truly my passion. And um, if ever you have questions or concerns about tube feeding, go ahead and visit my website and I'll try to be there for you and support you as best as I can. All right, thank you so much.